Thank you. It's been great being here discussing about uh, my topic is uh, more practical. So once we have a patient uh, that we think it has allergic rhinitis, the history, as Dr. Schwab mentioned, is very important. It's um, compatible with allergic rhinitis. We do allergy testing and we might be very lucky and be on this side that we have one positivity. So let's say uh, the patient is sensitized to dust mites, history is compatible, then that's it. We discuss uh, treatment options with the patients, with the patient. Um, but most of the time, and it was mentioned before, we are on this side. The patient is polysensitized, and it can be to multiple allergens. And sometimes, by history alone, it's not easy to 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 establish what the patient is sensitized to. So we need to look at the more different uh, different things. So how do we establish? Or how do we know what triggers the patient's symptoms? We need to know the allergens that are around us. And as was previously discussed, pollens are important, dust mites are important, uh, molds are important, and pets are important, animal gender. So when we think about pollens, we need to know what pollens are present in our area. Do the symptoms the patient have correlate with pollen season? And this is tricky, and we I will talk more about this. And it's also very important that sometimes pollen seasons overlap. It's not so clear, like for example, in Germany, it's very easy to differentiate when a patient is sensitized to birch pollen, which is an early flowering tree. Um, patient has symptoms in January, February, March, but as compared to grass pollen, with, uh, that happens later, um, May, June, uh, but sometimes it's not that easy and sometimes we have different pollens at the same time. So how do we manage that? Here, as it was mentioned before, we have grasses. It's particularly important Bermuda grass. Um, we also have weeds, um, Canopodiaceae, salsola, Canopodium, but also Artemisia, Paretarium, and we have trees, but we don't have betula, we don't have birch pollen here, which is included in most of the panels that we that we do. And it's something to think about. Um, we might have patients that come from other countries and live abroad, uh, travel often, so they are sensitized to birch pollen, but is that relevant to the symptoms that the patient has? Here in Abu Dhabi? No, it's not. The trees that we have here are carved tree, uh, which is a uh, part of mesquite family. And we also have uh, palm trees. Palm trees are only relevant to very few patients. Patients that live next to or spend time next to uh, palm orchards because a uh, palm pollen is very heavy and it falls very quickly. It doesn't travel kilometers as other pollens do. So how do we know when pollen season is? We know um, there are a lot of calendars published, but how do we get to, to a pollen calendar? So we need pollen collectors, and I don't know if uh, you've seen this type of devices before. So pollen collectors are usually placed on top of buildings and they capture pollen. They move around and they capture pollen. So pollen enters, it's very difficult to point. So maybe here, yeah, it's this too. No, it's not, but let me get closer. So yeah, now it's better. So pollen enters through here. There's a drum, and inside the drum, this is the drum, inside the drum, 
there's an adhesive tape. I'm sorry, I just realized that's in Spanish. <laughs> there's an adhesive tape here that moves continuously and the pollen gets stuck here. So we know the type of pollen because we are able to look at the microscope and identify the type of pollen. And we know the, uh, the pollen count. We know if it's only one grain, two grains or 50 grains. So that gives us a lot of information. Unfortunately, here in the country, we don't have any, any pollen trap. So we don't know uh, what's the pollen count here. We are able to build calendars. And if we look at grasses in most of the areas where we have calendars, grass pollen are uh, April, depending on the countries in more uh, southern countries, it starts in April, but uh, northern countries is June or even July. We have some information of the area, and uh, this study was done in, in Qatar. Uh, they collected pollen in two locations, in Doha and in Al Khor city. And if we look at grasses, grasses are here, it's uh, Poasia. Pollen was found from October till April, so winter. So our patients sensitized to grass pollen here, we can assume that we have, uh, they will have symptoms in winter and not um, May, June as other countries. And the same for the rest of, of the pollens. Pollen season are, are different. And the other um, idea that we can get from uh, these pictures is we have pollen all year round. In some countries, pollen is very seasonal. But in other places, and that's the case, for example, in Spain, I'm from Spain, we have pollen, pollen all year round. We have pollens in January, and we have pollens in May, we have pollens in July and August, and it seems that it's the case here as well. Probably we don't have any pollen in July and August because it's way too hot to, to pollinize, but most likely we have pollen the rest of the, of the year. So what do we do with patients sensitized to multiple pollens? And we are not really sure about pollen seasons. We are not even uh, we are not able to do a proper calendar. We don't know um, what's the relevant pollen. So we have component result diagnosis. And um, Dr. Shue previously mentioned that we can look not just if, at, if the patient is sensitized to one particular pollen, if the patient is sensitized to grasses, but we are able to look at what proteins the patient is sensitized to. So in case of grasses, I will give the example of grasses. We have major allergens, pleon P1 and pleon P5, that if the patient is sensitized to those allergens, we can assure that the patient is allergic to grass pollen. On the contrary, if the patient is sensitized to minor allergens or pan allergens, uh, Dr. Schwab explained what a pan allergen is. It's an allergen, it's a protein that is present in many different sources, many different pollens, also food. The patient might have a positive result to grasses, but might not be truly allergic to grasses. So this is an example of an algorithm of how to manage these patients. So for grasses, we have positive skin prints tests, positive specific IgE, but we really need to look into Fleon P1 and Fleon P5 to truly determine there is a dominant pollen allergy. And then we can consider allergic immunotherapy or the strategy we agree with the patient. But if the patient is not sensitized to Fleon P1, Fleon P5, but to other allergens within this uh, grass pollen, this patient is not a candidate for immunotherapy to grass pollen. And the same uh, is true for, for the rest of the, the pollens and the rest of the, the allergens. When we talk about dust mites, um, 
dust mites is not always a, a perennial allergen. I, it was mentioned before, and it varies from region to region. Uh, in Spain, it's perennial uh, in most of the coastal, but if you go to the Canary Island, it's quite seasonal, it, and it depends on the rain season. So when it rains, two months after, one month after, there's a peak of, of uh, mites. So the patient doesn't have always the same symptoms. It fluctuates, so we need to be aware of that. Um, dust mites, what we call dust mites, is uh, dermatophagoides, steronicinos, and dermatophagoides farine. Oroglyphus is, is less relevant, but we also have other species of mites. And most likely uh, here, uh, Blomia tropicalis is very relevant, so we also need to think about it. Um, in some areas, uh, we have maps. We have maps of that tell us what regions mites are relevant enough to cause allergies. And this map, for example, here show that in the northern coast, uh, this area of Spain is very green, very humid. So the exposure to, to dust mites is really high as compared to, for example, Mediterranean coast, that the exposure is not as high as we might think. And the same, uh, we have maps that tell us what type of, of dust mites species are relevant or are present in, in each of the, the cities or each of the regions. And again, uh, we should look at what the patient is sensitized to, because uh, in the case of a dermatophagoides teronicinus, we need to be sure before deciding to prescribe immunotherapy that the patient is sensitized, is truly, is truly allergic and not only sensitized. And that is when the patient is sensitized to derpy one and derpy two, which are the major allergens all around the world. Some patients might have positive skin prick tests or positive uh, a specific IgE because they are sensitized to their P10, which is atropomyosin, that is present in most of the arthropods. So those patients will have positive tests to all dust mites, but also to seafood, to crustaceans, to shrimp. These are the patients that have positive skin prick tests to, to shrimp. Molds, again, uh, we have identified the relevant allergens. Alternaria overall is um, the most important one. And almost 90% uh, of the patients are sensitized to Alt-A1, which is a major allergen. Aspergillus is, uh, is, is very important, but not only as uh, trigger of allergic rhinitis, but as you all well know, um, it's very important to other uh, conditions as uh, ABPA, for example. When we talk about animal dander, it's the same thing. We need to be on one side sure that the patient is exposed to the animal, but also be be sure that the patient is sensitized to the major allergens. And for example, in cat, which is the most uh, relevant uh, aller uh, pet here, most of the patients have cats at home or uh, have friends or family members that have cats. We need to make sure that it's sensitized to FLV1. We can further discuss this. Uh, dogs are more tricky and the sensitization profile might indicate other uh, allergic uh, symptoms, allergic conditions. Uh, and similar to what I described before for grasses, we have the same type of algorithm for, for cats and, and dogs. So as last part of my talk, uh, I would like to mention uh, food allergy. So I receive a lot of patients that uh, have been tested in other places with panels. Uh, the only mention 
go to their doctor saying, I have nasal symptoms, nasal congestion, sneezing, uh, and they get a, a panel of aeroallergens that, that we can discuss whether includes the relevant allergens for the area, but for the most part includes what gives us information, right? But many of them, they also get a food panel. And the problem is some of these patients have positivities to foods. And Dr. Shui mentioned before these panallergens, there are two main uh, panallergens that are causing this uh, sensitivity. And just to mention again, and because it's, this is really, really important, profilins and LTP are present in pollens, in all the pollens that are relevant here, but are also present in most of the plant, uh, plant foods. So uh, a patient that has allergic rhinitis and is sensitized to grasses, to, to weeds, about 30, 40% of them will have positive skin plate tests or positive specific I, IgE to any of these foods. And this is not to, to go into the details, it's just to, for you to see how many foods can this patient test positive. And it's the same thing with dust mites and uh, shrimp or, or lobsters, because the patient might be sensitized to tropomyosin, and tropomyosin, therapy 10 I, that I mentioned before, is present in many seafoods. So this is a very important message. Unless the patient has symptoms with food, we don't test for foods. Okay, so um, we need to know the relevant allergens in our areas. We need to know what the patient is sensitized to. And ideally, we should have the sensitization profile of our patients. And I know um, we can discuss about this later on. It's tricky because we don't have uh, in the country availability to do all these components. But ideally, we should use them to diagnose and treat our patients and never test for food allergy unless the patient has symptoms with foods. <laughs>